we're live. Okay. Welcome, folks. This is Tuesday, February 23rd. This is the House Corrections and Institutions Committee. Uh, we're going to spend the next half hour with our legal counsel, Eric Fitzpatrick, doing a walkthrough of S-18, which passed the Senate last week. It came out of Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, this deals with a very limited carve out of earned good time reductions for some folks who are currently sentenced. And um, it's on our webpage, S18, and I'm gonna turn it over to Eric. So Eric, if you could introduce yourself for the record and give us a walkthrough. Thank you. Sure, happy to. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. It's my first time in House Corrections and Institutions this year. So great to see everybody. And we'll see uh, more of you, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, so for the record, uh, this is Eric Fitzpatrick. I'm uh, with the Office of the Legislative Council and here to talk today with the committee and give the introductory walkthrough of S-18, which is entitled An Act Relating to Limiting Earned Good Time Sentence Reductions for Offenders Convicted of Certain Crimes. Uh, what I had thought, and I, I realized I probably should have asked Philip about this beforehand, uh, Representative Emmons, but I thought I would just talk for a minute or two, give the committee the big picture of what, what goes on in the bill. And then do you like to have a, a shared screen so that you can see the bill as I walk through it, or do you prefer I don't? Either way is fine, but uh, whatever you like. I prefer not to. I think everyone has access to the bill, do they? Okay. I'm seeing nods. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. So before I even look at the language, I like to, in terms of a walkthrough often, because um, sometimes when you look at, when you dive right into the words, you can get a little lost in the weeds when it's nice to sort of at, at first just have a minute or two of the big picture of what's going on. So S18 really did four things to the Earn Good Time program. And I know this committee is very familiar with the Earn Good Time program. I've, I've been in here myself over the years, as has Bryn, and I know you've spent a lot of time with it. So people are, are familiar with it. It's a a program that the Department of Corrections runs that uh, allows an inmate to earn reductions in their sentence if they behave well and, and don't commit any major uh, disciplinary violations while they're under DOC supervision. So uh, I believe the, the setup right now is uh, there's an opportunity for the inmate, assuming they don't get any of these major disciplinary uh, violations, they can get seven days off their sentence, their minimum and maximum per month. So Again, it's conditioned on their behavior. Uh, so this program has been in effect, actually, interestingly, it was in effect for 40 years uh, until 2005 when the legislature repealed it. And then you reinstated it again, uh, or I should say reinstated it, uh, put it back on the books again uh, in 2019. And this committee spent a lot of time with, with Act 56 that year. So uh, the Good Time program was reestablished in 2019. Uh, there was another bill you worked on last year to do some tweaking of it, uh, and now it's before you again. And the, the essentially what's going on in S18 is four proposed uh, modifications to the good time program that were made, uh, as the chair mentioned, in Senate Judiciary. So the first one is really a terminology issue. You may notice that the, that the uh, earned good time program in the Senate bill uh, becomes the earned time program. So the word good is struck in each instance. And the, the concept behind that was that the committee felt that in some ways that a, a calling it a good time program isn't really accurate. It's really not a question of whether an inmate has been good or not good. It's a question of whether they have not committed uh, major disciplinary violations or, or been reincarcerated for a violation of conditions of release. And that's not really, a, 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 you know, the good or not good is really not necessarily an accurate term for that. It's whether someone has complied with uh, their requirements in such a way that they have earned uh, the right to have their sentence reduced. So that's what it really is, is earned time. So that's why uh, the proposal from the Senate is to refer to call the program the earned time program. So that's change number one. I should say there are four changes to four primary substantive changes here, and that's the first one. The second one, uh, the chair alluded to already, you may recall that the, uh, that the statute as it uh, came out of this committee in the legislature pretty much permitted GERD uh, earned time. I'll, I may refer to it, it's hard to get used to referring to it as earned time all the time. You forget not to use the word good. So you know what I refer to if, if I say it one way or the other. But 
uh, as, as the statute has been on the books, the, the Earn Time program permitted pretty much any inmate to earn time with a couple of exceptions. So it didn't matter it didn't what a person was convicted of as long as they weren't convicted of an, of an offense that got them sentenced to life without parole. A life without parole sentence uh, did not qualify for earned good time. But other offenses did. Uh, as long as the person wasn't on probation, uh, um, even furlough, they, they would still qualify. So in terms of the, the offense that a person had committed, as long as it wasn't life without parole, uh, a person could earn good time. Again, doesn't mean they automatically get it, but provided that they, they didn't commit any violation. So the proposal from in S18 is to, uh, as the chair mentioned, a carve out uh, beyond life without parole offenses. Now, what this does, the carve out, is it names a certain group of offenses a disqualifying offense. And those offenses are murder, kidnapping, voluntary manslaughter, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault of a child, and lewd and lascivious conduct with a child. Those are the disqualifying offenses. So if a person is incarcerated already, and again, this does not apply in the future, only applies to people who are incarcerated as of the time that this legislation goes into effect. If a person is incarcerated for one of those disqualifying offenses that I just mentioned, then that person will not qualify for the earn, or sorry, the good, the earn time program in the future. Now that if they've already, remember you probably, I think this committee has already heard the department has already, uh, the rule is already in effect. It went into effect on January 1st of this year. So people are earning good time already and they have been for the last, where are we now? Almost, uh, almost two, a month and a half, two months roughly. Um, so uh, it, you can't take away good time that someone has already earned. So, so the, let, the language when we look at it specifically says, this doesn't affect any good time that a person has already earned. But going forward, after this act takes effect, if it takes effect, but after the effective date of the act, a person who was incarcerated for one of those disqualifying offenses at the time the act passes would not earn any additional good time in the future. So uh, that, as the chair mentioned, is a carve out. You know, it's, a, it's taking a, a universe of people, people who have been incarcerated for one of those offenses um, and saying, going forward, you can't earn good time. Now, if someone commits one of those offenses on September 1st of this year or January 1st of next year, or sometime in the future, that person can still qualify for good time. But the ones who are incarcerated already uh, will not be able to. And uh, as you may have heard that, that that policy decision by the Senate Judiciary Committee was driven by the, the way that the, um, the good time program when it was reinstituted impacted certain crime victims. And the, the issue behind that was that if you think about it, you know, someone, for example, who has been convicted of one of those offenses, you know, three, five, 10 years ago, whenever it was, um, in the past, mo you know, well over 90% of, of those criminal cases get resolved by plea bargains in Vermont. And during that plea bargaining process, typically the crime victim has a voice the, through the state's attorney to be able to participate and articulate their point of view. Those agreements about what sentence a defendant would serve are reached. And the, the concern that the Senate Judiciary Committee had was that uh, at the time, there was no good time program in effect. So there was no discussion of how a defendant's future earning of good time might reduce their sentence. So that was not something that anyone could have any or, or would have any perspective about because it didn't exist. Uh, so now, in retrospect, I think the, the committee saw that um, as a result of those same folks, those same folks who reached a plea bargain, say, uh, as I said, in the past, earn good time starts January 1st of 2021. They start earning uh, good time. Over time, it reduces their sentence. And it becomes, it could become years less than what uh, the state's attorney, the crime victims, and everybody else who, who were involved in that plea agreement thought that it would be, the court as well, for that matter. Um, so that's what drove that decision. And that's why, the, the as I mentioned, it only applies retrospect, retroactively. It doesn't apply to people in the future. It only applies to people who are already incarcerated because it, it rests upon the assumption or, or uh, the policy assumption that those folks uh, 
had already reached the plea agreement that didn't incorporate the idea of good time because good time didn't exist at the time. So uh, there was no notice to any victims or anybody else that a person's sentence might be reduced on account of good time because there was no good time. So that's the reason for that uh, second major change in the bill. And it sort of segues me right into the, to the third um, change. As I mentioned, this is re that really turns upon notice to the victim, right? It's driven by this concern that the committee had about, well, it isn't really fair to reduce the sentence now because there was no notice at the time uh, that that might have happened. That might be an occurrence in the future that could happen, that a person's sentence could be reduced as a result of them earning good time uh, while incarcerated. So what the sort of part and parcel with uh, permitting defendants in the future to earn good time is to make sure victims get notice in the future. So that's the other, that's the third change in the bill, that it provides specifically that at sentencing, and you already have a statute, there's already a statute that, that lists certain information that has to be provided by the state's attorney to crime victims. So all it does is add something to that list. And what it adds to that list is, as you would expect, the fact that somebody could earn, uh, it has to be an estimate of how much good time a person could earn, has to be disclosed to them by the prosecution, as well as the fact that, uh, you know, that earn time, uh, reduce, you know, sort of, the practical effect of it is not that someone automatically gets released, it's that they are able to appear before the parole board earlier and argue for release. But it doesn't mean that the parole board necessarily will decide in each case that the person should get out. It just means that there's an earlier time when they get to make that argument. So those two points are clarified that that information has to be provided from the state's attorney uh, to the victim. And in that sense, uh, I think the Judiciary Committee and the Senate felt comfortable allowing folks even committed of these offenses to participate in good time in the future because in those situations the victim will have plenty of opportunity to have input if they want to. Um, so that is change number three that's and the last one was something actually that the department had asked for the uh, DOC asked uh, to clarify that and remember I just said that um, you know under the current statute there's a list of sort of what categories of folks qualify for the Earn Good Time program and, and who don't, who does not, sorry. Uh, and that list of who doesn't include a life without parole and um, furlough sentences as well. Oh, no, sorry, furlough does qualify, but uh, I think uh, probation does not. Uh, the, so the DOC had noticed that the, there's needed to be some clarification that what's known as interrupted sentences or what they're actually referring to as uh, well, the term is used that DOC, as DOC understands it. If someone is sentenced to an interrupted sentence, which the, the bill defines, you'll see, uh, as a sentence that is intermittently served. And that means a sentence, for example, uh, of uh, serving your time on weekends or on work crew. You know, when you go for, you know, the day of work, but you're not staying overnight, you're, you go back home or you only go for a, several weekends of a month. Those are our uh, interrupted sentences and, and the department felt that, um, you know, those sentences are served not continuously anyway. They're only served at intervals and it doesn't really make sense for earned time to apply to those sentences. So, so uh, in response to that request from the department, the Judiciary Committee put that in as well. So those are your four things that the bill does right there. It's the change in name from earn good time to earn time, the, uh, the exclusion from the earn time program of those who defendants who are already incarcerated who committed one of those disqualifying offenses, the um, the also exclusion from the program of what I just referred to as interrupted sentences, and um, what did I forget? What was the fourth one? Notifying uh, the victims. Upon oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And the victim notification piece. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Evans. <laughs> um, so those are them. That's the big the big picture. We can certainly look at the language. Hopefully it will confirm what, what uh, I just explained, but I certainly could pause here if there's any questions sort of on the concepts or I can move right in whatever, whatever you prefer. Eric, we do have a couple of questions, but I do want to clarify one thing. Um, when you say it's folks who are incarcerated, the current folks who are incarcerated, there would be a carve out for them. I want to be very clear. It's current folks who are sentenced 
and incarcerated. It's not the detainees who have been charged with these crimes yet, correct? Because they have not gone through sentencing. They have not been convicted. They've been charged. So they would, this bill does not pertain to those folks, correct? Yes, correct. Thank you for that clarification. Exactly. It's a person who has been, who has been sentenced to one of those crimes already. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. a detainee who is being charged for one of those crimes. And if right. that detainee, after this bill becomes law, if this bill becomes law, and a current detainee who's charged under some of these carve out crimes are sentenced after the bill becomes law, they would qualify for earned time because that would be part of the plea agreement between the state's attorney, the defense counsel, and the victims. That's absolutely right. Yep. The, uh, the sentencing is the key moment in time as to whether you uh, uh, are covered by the carve out or not. If you've been sentenced already, then uh, yes, you, pro you wouldn't be able to earn it for one of those offenses. But if you're sentenced any time after just picking a date, say July 1st, if that's when it went into effect, sentenced any time after that, um, then yes, even if you are detained now, uh, if you're not sentenced until then, then you would be able to earn good time. I just wanted to make sure that was really clear for the committee members. For that. Yes, thank you. So we do have a couple questions, Scott. And some of this, again, for folks who are asking questions, may be addressed as we do the walkthrough with the language. Okay, well, Scott and then Linda. Thank you. This is sort of a background question. I don't know if there's time to talk about it now, but I'm just wondering why Good Time was suspended or, or ended in 2005. What were the arguments about that? You want me to answer that one, Eric? <laughs> yes, I think you'd know better than I. <laughs> Came through this committee. <laughs> and uh, it was suspend. It was done away with because there was a push from the public for truth and sentencing, and it really was feeling that you have a sentence when you um, are given a sentence in court, and it's been agreed to through a plea bargain. And if you're to serve five years as your minimum, you should be serving five years, not four and a half, if you've earned any good time. So it was truth and sentencing. So what happened at that point when we did away with good time, when it became law, um, those folks who were sentenced after it became law were not eligible for good time, but those folks who were currently sentenced could continue to receive their good time until, I don't think, we didn't do away with it, Eric, I don't think, for those current folks who were sentenced. I don't remember that. If we did Actually, it. no, you didn't. And, and in a very interesting bit of history, uh, you actually, there was what was known as a true up program yes. had to be done so that uh, those folks who were already sentenced um, with the under a good time program, they were awarded all of the good time that they would have earned in the future. At, one, at once, all in the, the legislature, you, you folks passed a statute to award them that they called it the true up program. So they were trued up. And then everybody started from zero, which as you say, was uh, not having the good time program anymore. And we did that because we wanted to make it easy for DOC in calculating good time because it is very, very difficult in calculation of good time with DOC. And we can get into that when we bring them in for testimony. The other thing that we also put in place when we did away with good time, we put in um, reintegration furlough. I think it was called reintegration furlough, not conditional reentry. I think it was reintegration furlough. At the time we said, you know, there are offenders who are playing by the rules and they, they should have some initiative to continue playing by the rules and DOC needs some management tools. So we put this in place, I think it was called reintegration furlough where a person who played by the rules and would have normally received good time could um, be eligible for furlough three months prior to their minimum date. So we put that in as sort of a release valve that if they um, participate in their programming, uh, didn't have any DRs, that three months prior to when their minimum was up, they could possibly be released on, on that status of reintegration furlough. Okay, well, okay. it does sound very complicated though to calculate. 
Welcome to DOC. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Linda. Uh, thank you. I lowered my hand because you, my question was answered by your questions. Thank you. Uh, Kurt. I, well, I got to say to change the name, earn time or earn, yeah, earn time doesn't make any sense to me as well, we're, it almost sounds like they're earning more time. I would, but they're I not make, having a good time doing it. And I would make it uh, earned reduction in sentence. <laughs> if it were named earned reduction in sentence or just ERS for those people who don't like three words, it might be uh, clearer exactly what it's doing. Something to think about. Something to think about. So when we'll we'll be doing a more work on this bill. So keep that in mind, Kurt. Okay, Eric, why don't you give us a walkthrough here? Sure. <clears throat> so now we'll proceed to the language of the bill and you'll see that the very first section is the victim notification piece. Remember of the four, the four uh, substantive changes to the good time program made in S18. Uh, the first one you see in the bill has to do with uh, the victim, crime victim being provided notice that uh, this program exists and that the defendant has an opportunity to earn a sentence reduction for that reason. So you see, as I mentioned, there's an existing statute on what victims' rights are. That's in Title 13, Section 5321. That's Section 1 of the bill. And this just adds, there's already a number of uh, disclosures that the state's attorney has to make to the victim in those situations. The prosecutor has to tell them uh, uh, enlisted crimes, uh, you know, what the incarceration period might be. Um, if you start on line 16, this is the sentence that gets added to. The, the, an existing law, the prosecutor's office has to explain the significance of a minimum and maximum sentence to the victim. I'm on line 18 now, explain the function of parole and how that may affect the actual amount of time the defendant may be incarcerated. So you see it conceptually makes sense to, to add this here. It's sort of a similar concept. And then you add, and the proposal here is to add to that list of disclosures and inform the victim of the maximum amount of earned time that the defendant could accrue. I'm turning over onto page two now. Oh, and excuse, me, second, time. Excuse, excuse me, Madam Chair. Yeah. The, the copies that we have have line numbers in them. Does yours no, have line numbers? They num don't. They don't. So I'm just, while he's going through the bill, he's not going to be able to cite line numbers. Yeah. Oh, you don't have line numbers on no, your copies? No. 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 So we're in oh, okay. section 1D. Yes. Right at the bottom of our first page. Right. So everybody with that new line so far? That the, uh, that the very first underlined new language requires that the state's attorney inform the victim of the maximum amount of earned time that the defendant could accrue. And now I'm turning over onto page two. Is that consistent with everybody's copy? Does that go onto page two now? Page two starts with section two. Oh, interesting. Um, in that case, I'm still on your page one. <laughs> because you thought at the end of that sub, subsection D provides, and additionally, that the, the state's attorney has to notify the victim of the fact that earned time only affects when a defendant is eligible for parole consideration, but does not necessarily result in the defendant's release. It might, but it might not. Um, so uh, that's added to the, the disclosures that the state's attorney has to make to the victim. So Eric, do you want to stop at each section just to see if folks have questions? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So whenever a person reaches their minimum, whatever they may be currently, they are eligible for furlough. And under Act 148 that we put in place last year for some certain crimes, <clears throat> which would not pertain here, they would be eligible for presumptive parole. Going forward, there would be more crimes that are sentenced that will qualify for presumptive parole. So when they say parole here, there's, they're in, uh, referring to the presumptive parole, which is gonna be taking over the furlough. So Eric, I do have a question on this because there will be some folks with this carve out. Well, this is going forward though, right? Correct. This is going forward. This doesn't pertain to those folks who are currently sentenced. So this is going forward when the bill becomes law for those folks who will be sentenced for 
any crime, not just, is it just listed? It's just listed crimes, right? It's just for listed crimes, this section, correct? That's what it looks like. Prosecutor's office shall instruct the victim of a listed crime. That's in the beginning of D. Yes, okay. that's an interesting question. The, the, the first sentence of definitely applies only to listed crimes. And I think uh, that didn't come up in the Senate because it, it, it does say in addition, the second sentence starts with the, starts in addition. So that would seem to suggest that it would also only applies to listed crimes, but I'd wanna double check on that to be certain. So if it only applies to listed crimes, how many of those listed crimes as we go forward in the presumptive parole would not qualify for presumptive parole and still only qualify for furlough? Because I'm asking that because on the next to the last line where it says earn time effects when a defendant is eligible for parole consideration, they may also at some point be only eligible for furlough at their minimum because we did carve out a few crimes on the presumptive parole going forward. You know what, do you understand what I'm saying? I don't, I'm not familiar with those programs. Okay, I think so, Brent is, because yes. we phased in, we phased in presumptive parole. So we're doing the real misdemeanor crimes first, and then we're doing the next step up. And I don't know if we're doing the big 12 for presumptive parole or not. Yeah, I'm not sure either. And, and I, I don't know to what extent that would interplay with the this defendant disclosure here. But I can check with Brent on that. Yeah, why don't you check with Brent on that? Because some of the folks may not even qualify for presumptive parole, but there would be a minimum that they could reach that they would qualify for furlough. Madam Chair, could you define listed crimes? Uh, Eric. <laughs> it is a lengthy list of, of several dozen offenses that are in Title 13. So I can send that to the committee. But you're more violent crimes that are felonies that pertain to violence against a person, basically. Typically, although there are some, for example, of like, uh, you know, um, Driving with a license, driving with a license suspended with death or serious bodily injury resulting, or reckless reckless endangerment, that sort of thing. So, it's it's a it's a broad list, um, but I can send it to the committee. It's in statute. So, Eric, if you could, at some point, it would be after town meeting break or after crossover, if we can work with Bryn to make sure this language is reflective of what we did in Act 148 with presumptive parole and when some of those crimes would be eligible or not eligible? Yeah, definitely. Because we may also want to indicate here that those uh, folks might be sentenced and they won't be eligible for parole status. Right. They'll be eligible for furlough prior to a parole status. Yes, definitely. Okay. I will check in with her for sure. Okay. Uh, Kurt? Uh, Madam Chair, I have that list of, of listed crimes in Big 12 from last session. Do you want me to send that to the committee or to... Why don't you send it to Phil and then we can do that. Okay. Yeah. I'll do that. It's very, it's not really clear. Your Big 12, your listed crimes. It's, it's hard to follow in some cases. Okay. Anything, so we'll flag this, okay, for folks. Okay. So I have to note that I'm mindful of the time. I know. And uh, I have to be in Senate Judiciary in about 10 minutes. Okay, let's keep so moving. So I can move through as quickly as we can there. Yeah. So you'll see in section two that uh, the second main change that I mentioned, you'll see starts right away in the title of section 818 in that the word good is struck. So this is the name change piece. Remember, you'll see, and pretty much every time you see the word good, it will be struck through because the, the proposal is to rename the program from the earned good time program to the earned time program. So that's uh, major change number two. Also in section two, if you start in, if you go to subdivision B1, you'll see, and this is the third main change that I mentioned, 
This is the list of for whom the earned time program is available to. So existing law, if you go to B1, you'll see the program, program is available to all sentenced offenders, including furloughed offenders, provided that the program shall not be available to offenders on probation or parole, to offenders eligible for a reduction of term under Section 811, and then it adds to offenders sentenced to serve an interrupted sentence. So that's the, it's also not going to be available to folks who serve an interrupted sentence. Now, it's somewhat out of order, but as we often do things, the definition section is at the end of this statute. So if you were to turn to the very last page of the bill, in fact, the very last couple of lines of the bill, right above the effective date, that's where the definition section is. And you'll see the interrupted sentence is defined. That's why I'm turning you to there right now. Interrupted sentence means a sentence that is not served continuously, including a sentence to be served at intervals or a sentence to the work group. Now, according to Monica Weaver, uh, who we, I worked on that language with, uh, the interrupted sentence is a common term within the department. Everyone knows what that means. And uh, a sentence to be served at intervals is a reference to a weekend sentence as well. That's the way they refer to that. So that's where that definitional language came from. And again, the point, the reason that it's there is because, as we just noted, offenders who are serving an interrupted sentence would not be able to earn, um, earn time under the proposal. So that's change number three. And now we get to the, the last change, change number four, which is also in subdivision B1, although this is really just pointing us to where it is. But you look at that last new language just says, notwithstanding the subdivision one, that means notwithstanding everything else that was just said about who qualifies and who doesn't. When an offender has been convicted of a disqualifying offense, right, then the ability to, the, that offender's ability to participate and earn time is going to be determined pursuant to a separate subdivision of the section. So that's basically just redirecting uh, you to where the disqualifying offense procedure is going to be described. So let's follow the instructions of that subdivision and go right to subdivision five, which is at the very second to last page of the bill, page four. So this is the new language regarding disqualifying offenses and how that's handled. You see this new subdivision five here. And it says that uh, notwithstanding one BSA 214, that's the statutory provision that, that legislation generally applies prospectively into the future, but not retroactively into the past. And we have to say that because in this case, it is applying retroactively into the past. It's applying to people who have been sentenced already. Um, so notwithstanding that provision, an offender who is serving a sentence for a disqualifying offense on the effective date of this subdivision five, this is the key point that uh, the chair mentioned earlier. So they're serving a sentence on the effective date of this subdivision. So when this goes into effect, they're already served, they're already sentenced. We move on, shall not earn any earned time sentence reductions under the section after the effective date of this act. So again, just it may not be July 1st, but just picking a, a date to help us understand it. Let's say the act goes into effect on July 1st. Someone who is sentenced as of that date for a disqualifying offense is not going to earn any earned time sentence reductions after the effective date or after July 1st. However, this goes into the second sentence. This subdivision five shall not be construed to limit or affect earned time that an offender has earned on or before the effective date of this act. So any earned time that they have already, again, using that July 1st date as our sort of hypothetical example, as of July 1st, those disqualifying offense offenders aren't gonna earn any more good time in the future if they've been sentenced on that date, but any earned time that they accumulated prior to July 1st, they get to keep, you can't take that away. So uh, that's the proposal for how that would work. And then of course, the, the crucial question is, well, what's a disqualifying offense then? If that's the universe of who, to whom this applies, and that's defined in the definition subsection, which you see next. And as I mentioned, a disqualifying offense, the disqualifying offenses are murder, voluntary manslaughter, kidnapping, LNL with a child, uh, as long as it fits within the age gap that it's in statute right now, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, and aggravated sexual assault of a child. So those are the the disqualifying offenses that if someone is sentenced for one of those offenses as of the effective date of the act, they keep the good time that they have so far, they don't earn any more in the future. Great, thank you, Eric. Sure. 
Any questions? I know this is a quick walkthrough. We'll be taking a lot more testimony on the bill. Any further questions? So it's a very limited carve out for particular crimes, only for those folks who are currently serving a sentence for those crimes. They can, can keep the good time or earn time that they've already accrued until this bill becomes law. So if the bill becomes law in April, then that's when they stop earning good time, but they get to keep what they've already earned. And going forward, anyone who is convicted and sentenced for these crimes, they will earn, earn, earn time and the victim will be notified by the state's attorney's office in the plea agreement realm that these are the possibilities of when the person might be eligible for parole or possibly furlough. We can straighten that one out. So that's- Yeah, I think we'll that's it exactly. Yeah. Okay, questions, people confused? I see some <laughs> confusion on people's faces. Okay. Oh, good. That's any a, a questions good from anyone? <laughs> Lynn, are you, Lynn, any questions? Marsha? No, I went through it when I was working for the prison, so I, I understand it pretty well. Okay, Thank Marcia, you. Any questions? You're muted. This last thing that you just talked about where they would earn good time going forward after this is passed. This isn't if, for the this isn't for the uh, disqualifying offenses though, right? Yes, it is. It's for folks who have not been sentenced yet. Oh, they haven't they been have charged. They've been charged, but they haven't been sentenced. So if they're going to be sentenced after this becomes law, they will qualify to have earned time for these crimes because it's part of the plea agreement that is worked up with the victim. So the victim okay, is really clear. Okay, thank you. Okay, Linda, any questions? Kurt? Sarah? I know we'll be discussing it more, so. Okay, Mary, anything? I, I think I'm good at the moment. I'll probably have further questions when, when we do a deeper dive. Okay. How about you, Michelle? Anything? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a question right now. Scott? I do have questions, but I'm going to wait until we are talking about it in more depth. Okay. And Karen? Yeah, same as Scott. I've written down some questions, but feel like we'll have opportunity to address them. We'll have plenty of opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, sure. That you're welcome. Glad to glad to help out. Just let me know when uh, when you're going to take the bill up again, and uh, and we'll see you then. Okay, we'll make sure you have enough time to do the work with the other committees that you need to do for crossover. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Nice to see everybody. Yep. Thank you. It's very yep, helpful. Bye. All right. Good. Bye now. Okay. Let's uh, quickly shift gears here a little bit. Is, and I'm assuming that Karen Gannett is in the waiting room. She is, Madam Chair. Okay, why don't we let Karen, let me do that quicker. Why don't we let Karen in? This afternoon, we're just gonna spend time really getting some background information. If folks remember, if folks remember a couple of weeks ago, we did some really deep dives into the numbers of folks who are incarcerated and their crime, serious felony um, versus the misdemeanors and calculated the numbers of folks were about 85 to about 90, ninety five percent of our folks who are incarcerated are incarcerated for sentences of uh, felony, felony sentences. And we wanted to do a deeper dive behind those numbers. And one thing that we talked about and we're gonna be dealing with this afternoon is what is called sequential intercept model, which some folks are familiar with here in the committee and some are not. And also we wanted to look at reentry programs, uh, transitional housing programs. So we're gonna be moving into that as well this afternoon. 
So I know a person who's done a tremendous amount of work with this committee in the past with um, initiatives that we've put in place to really look at the whole spectrum of the criminal justice system from the time someone is arrested, uh, either by a local police officer or state police, and then goes through the criminal justice system, the court system, and then is incarcerated. And then at the end of the incarceration is re-entered into the community. That's what we call the sequential process. And there's certain points that you can intercept that and maybe break the cycle of people continually going through the system. Uh, we worked a lot back in 2008, 2009 with uh, Karen Gannett, who was also at that point working within our uh, judicial system under Chief Justice Ryber. And Karen worked a lot on the sequential intercept model as well as really helping us with, with justice reinvestment too. So I thought it would be really good to bring Karen back in um, and just sort of give us the history of the sequential model and the sequential intercept. So welcome, Karen. Good to see you. Thank you. Wish, Thank you. Wish we were in the room with you. I have been thinking that more and more every day is I really miss face-to-face -face meetings. So for the record, I'm Karen Gannett. I'm the executive director of Crime Research Group. And yes, it would be fun to be back at the State House with you all. Um, so I started just to, so, so my plan for today is I'll give you a little information about um, what I'm doing now, what Crime Research Group is and how we might be able to be of a, assistance to you in, in our current role. And then talk a little bit about um, the sequential intercept model and how it came to be in Vermont. Um, and I gave a handout around CRG and I gave a handout that actually um, from the time Madam Chair and I worked on the sequential intercept model, SAMHSA and the um, Policy Research Institute have come a long way in some of their um, information, which is great. And I also gave you something that we worked on years ago um, that shows, and, and Phil and I have been in contact about this. I think the, what you have right now um, in your documents is Addison County's sequential intercept. And there is one, I sent an Excel spreadsheet, but Excel spreadsheets don't translate well to PDFs. Mm -hmm. So I did send um, Phil a um, rather large document that's an Excel spreadsheet that shows statewide sequential intercept and then one for every county. It's old. It was done um, back in 2015, but it gives you an idea of the work that we did back then. So what you see for Addison County now is what we have for every county and we have one for the whole state. So I, I can talk a little bit about that when we get to it. Pardon, pardon me, Karen, but I did send to the committee while we were chatting moments ago, that spreadsheet. So now they can open it up on their awesome. own device and see everything. Awesome, thank you, Phil. But to, on our web page, just to clarify, we do have the updated sequential intercept model county charts, which is really the Addison chart, which we could work off of that. That pretty that shows some of the intercepts and what was done. Yeah. Yes. And yes, absolutely. I just thought it would be fun for committee members to have their own county and have the information from their own county. Mm -hmm. So um, I work for Crime Research Group now. I started there about six and a half years ago. Um, Crime Research Group is a relatively small private nonprofit research center. We do crime and juvenile justice research. We have a contract with the Department of Public Safety to provide statistical analysis center services for Vermont. Um, so we work for you as well as other criminal justice stakeholders in Vermont, not just for DPS, just because the, the contract is with DPS, our work is broader than, than work with just DPS. Um, we also have other contracts with other um, state departments and nonprofits in the state when they need um, research or evaluation services. Every state has a statistical analysis center. 
Um, and they do primarily what we do as well. We provide data requests. We provide technical assistance around criminal justice issues. And we are, because we do the work as the SAC, we're allowed to apply for Bureau of Justice Statistics funding to create studies that work and benefit for the state of Vermont. So on that sheet you have right now, it gives you some information on the technical assistance we've provided in the past. So we work with the Sentencing Commission and we've reviewed all crimes and penalties to assist with the reclassification of the criminal code. They're doing work on that right now. We've worked with the National Criminal Justice Reform Project and we analyzed 1,500 surveys on the police reform initiatives that the Social Equity Caucus um, and Representative Coffey had a, a strong hand in that. And we analyzed the text from those surveys. Some of our current projects under the BJS grants are we we're doing a program, a study that looks at equal access to alternative programs to look at racial disparities. We're doing a human trafficking study with the Human Trafficking Task Force. And you can read the rest of that. I, I don't have to go through of all of what we do. One of the, I think, really interesting and most important things we do for people in the state is we do what's called um, the going rate for sentences. So attorneys, judges, you all can send in a data request to us and ask, what's a normal sentence for a DUI one with a fatality resulting? and you give us the statute of what you want us to look up. And we can give you up to 10 years of sentences for that crime. And we can do that for any crime. So we have access, we have a data sharing agreement with the courts. We have access to 30 years of court data. And so my researchers can go in and pull those, that sentencing data from the court data and give you information on what sentences are for specific crimes. A lot of attorneys write into us and ask this. And um, in a way, it's, it's a great way to kind of um, allow them to see what is tolerable in Vermont for sentences. And that's one of, the, one of the things we're working on with the Sentencing Commission is really going through the crimes and looking at what does the statute say the penalty is and what does what is Vermont tolerating for that penalty? So one of the examples that's given is um, the penalty for trafficking heroin is really high. And I'm not going to remember what it is off the top of my head, possibly 30 years. And nobody's gotten over 10 years um, for trafficking heroin. So that's the kind of thing we kind of take a look at what the statute says and what's actually happening and present the information to the sentencing commission so they can take a look at, do they wanna make some changes um, in some of the penalties based on what actually is happening out in the field? So that's crime research group. Does anyone have any questions about that so far? Questions? Uh, we have one, uh, Kirk. Um, yes, how, how detailed is with, with the, not, the net report that you're giving on the sentencing? Does it just say this is the average sentence or does it give a, uh, some information about what the minimums were, what the maximum, all mm -hmm. this? how detailed? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it does give, so if it's an incarcerative sentence, it gives the minimums and the maximum days to serve. If it's a deferred, it gives the... Um, the length of time of the deferred. If it's a split sentence, which is partially incarcerated and partially served in the community, it gives the minimum and maximum and the days to serve. And it tells you how many records there were. And it depends on what you ask us to some extent. It gives how many records there were. And it also gives, um, if folks want the docket numbers, we can provide the docket numbers. We can break it down by county. Um, if someone wants something more extensive, so for the Center of Crime Victim Services will ask us mm -hmm. to take a look at domestic violence crimes and sexual assault crimes and give them a breakdown over years and by county, and we can do that. Um, we can add age in sometimes. So we do a little more extensive data requests for some of the um, organizations that we work with. Okay, the, the basic report then is kind of a, a tool to help plea bar. 
Excuse me, I missed the last part of that. The, the basic tool is is a way to help plea bargaining, it sounds like. Yes, exactly. They'll, okay. they'll, they'll write in, attorneys will write in, they'll send us a data request and we have a form on our website and they'll say this is for, a, you know, an offer or for, you know, taking a look at an offer. Okay, good, thanks. You're welcome. So we have another question, Sarah. Madam Chair, I don't know if this is appropriate now. You can tell me. I, I just had a question. Um, uh, hello, Karen. <laughs> um, um, I had a question. You you referenced um, that in other states, um, the way that other states deal with data and data analysis, it's more baked into a state government. And you are a separate nonprofit organization. Is that correct? Am I I'm correct in understanding that right? And I'm just looking forward to hearing. Um, we, this committee with work that we did last year on justice reinvestment, you know, how we analyze data um, in our state, especially around racial, racial data is a real concern. And I know you've been involved with some of that work. So, and there are a lot of different ideas about mm -hmm. how we can do that. Um, and it seems like crime research group is an incredible resource to us and we shouldn't overlook this as a, as a resource, but how we best tap those, your services um, is a big, it, it remains to be a question for me about like how we organize um, uh, agencies, resources around this. So it's, I hope that we'll get to, to talk a little bit about that. Um, with you. Well, I can tell you, I can tell you as far as other states go. So there are 32 statistical analysis centers that are embedded in their, um, state organizations such as DPS or some other state organization. Um, there are eight statistical analysis centers that are connected to universities. And then, um, and ours is really, DPS is the name statistical analysis center in Vermont. I know our, our national association is called the Justice and Research Statistics Association, JRSA. And on their website, they do have us listed as the SAC and we're the lone red state that shows that we're a nonprofit, we're the SAC and we're a nonprofit, but technically it's, a, it's an executive order from the governor and, it, and DPS is named the SAC. Because they don't have the research staff to conduct all the studies that we're able to do, we're actually um, a good bang for the buck. Um, they couldn't hire all the people that I have on staff. I have three other people besides myself on staff, um, and it's a fairly good deal to hire us to do this work. And then we uh, we help them apply for the grant. So the grants actually come through DPS, but they are technically the statistical analysis center. We just do the work through a contract with them. And I think a lot. Um, I know that the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel is doing a lot of thinking around where best to put racial disparities analysis. Um, and I, I attended their last meeting and they had a lot of good thinking. It was more of a brainstorming session, but there was a lot of good thinking around that. And it is, we do do some of that work um, and I would be happy to talk more about that at some other time when when it seems appropriate. Yeah, that's that's exactly that's exactly where I'm coming from. And we our committees heard some of that. Um, we've got a report from RDAP, and I know they're grappling with some of this and have a you know figuring out the best way to do it. So I look forward to a deeper dive. But I know that's not really why you're here today. So thank you, thank I you, Madam Chair. And then the deeper dive is happening in House Judiciary. And they're doing a lot of good thinking on this. I think there's a lot of good thinking around this. Um, so, so sequential intercept. Yeah, let's go because, okay, great. Do you, you want me to move it along? Yeah, well, sort of. I know we've got someone at quarter of two, but we've got the word out that they're going to be delayed a little bit. It's DOC. So oh, I should be, fine. yeah, that, that'll be fine. Yeah, that, it, we, went to, we went longer on with Eric, so don't worry, Karen. All right, okay. So um, the sequential intercept model. So back in 2007, um, the Chief Justice convened a group to look at 
mental health and substance abuse issues in the criminal justice system. And we called it the um, Chief Justice Task Force on Mental Health and Criminal Justice Collaboration. And we, I worked for the judiciary at the time. So I, I worked with the Chief um, Justice to coordinate this, this project. And we pulled together legislators, um, commissioners, um, the agency secretary and judges to sit around the table and talk about what we do um, about people with mental health and substance abuse issues. A couple of years after that, um, and some advocates were at the table as well. A couple of years after that, it changed its name to the Tri-Branch Task Force on Co-Occurring Disorders and started developing a strategic plan. And during that time, um, we started looking at what was being developed at the Gain Center under SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Association. And it, it was called the Sequential Intercept Model. And it really is a conceptual framework for the criminal justice system. So if you look at the brochure that was in your documents, you'll get a really, they've, I, love their brochure. I think it's a great visual of the criminal justice system and all the points in the system where you can intervene and apply evidence-based practices to address people with mental health, substance abuse, and co-occurring disorders. And so since we worked with it back in the Tri-Branch Task Force, they've added on sequential intercept point zero, and it goes zero through whoops, five. zero through five. Okay. And, and so it just gives you a really nice snapshot of the criminal justice system. And in that document, it tells you below the actual continuum, it gives you an idea of, so what are the practices that can be employed at each one of those points to help people um, as they're making their way through the criminal justice system? One of the things that is not evident in that document is also looking at people based on their risk and need. So I know you've heard from the Department of Corrections information about how you assess someone for their risk and how you assess someone for their need. And this primarily looks at need, um, but there's also a piece where risk should be also identified and so the the treatment options or the intervention should be tailored for someone's risk and need. And so that just lays out a really nice document for taking a look at the criminal justice system. So the other document that you have that on the, on the doc, in the document shows just Addison, but you have received the um, SIM chart for all the counties in Vermont really is the work we did in what was called the core team underneath the Tri-Branch Task Force. And like I said, that document has not been updated since 2015, but I thought it would be interesting for you to see some of the work that we did in Vermont. The folks working on this in Vermont decided that some of the intercepts looked a little bit different. So you'll see some of the names are a little bit different than the brochure itself. And we didn't have intercept zero at the time. However, when you look at it, you can see what's available at each intercept in each county, which we were working on. How do you develop an evidence-based criminal justice system using the sequential intercept model and plugging in what we already have and then taking a look at what's needed? And this is actually one of the ways that we identified that pretrial services was a need in the state of Vermont. Pretrial services didn't exist at this time. And when you look at um, the statewide, we look, the, the first chart on the one you received in the Excel spreadsheet actually shows the state of Vermont and what was available statewide. And you can see that gap in intercept point two where there's court diversion, pretty much. And so there wasn't anything else that was going on in that at that time that was addressing people's needs pre-sentence, post-arraignment pre-sentence. And the approach that the core team and the Tri-Branch Task Force took was, 
what can we do to keep people from being incarcerated and going deeper into the criminal justice system? And if we focus on that intercept point and try and address the needs of people before they get to sentencing and maybe alleviate some of the sen sentencing that was happening, then there was a lot of focus on re-entry and it was really important to this group that they focus on pre-sentence. And so that's how um, pretrial services really was born in the state. And then Tamarack came along and um, some of the other options that we have in that intercept point now. So I'll stop for a minute. So we do have a question, uh, Scott. Thank you. Um, yeah, so <laughs> new, new information for me. I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding the concept. So the, the idea of, of, of the word intercept is, this is an opportunity to get somebody out of the system. Is that, is that what we're, so these are various points um, in which a person could be involved with the justice system and the, and the, and the concept of intercept is, this is a, an opportunity to get them out. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? I think that's part of it. I think it's to get them out or to address their needs before their sentence so that they stay out of trouble during that pretrial period. Right, right. Well, by get them out, I mean, I mean, um, get them back into the community, get them uninvolved in the justice system. Um, and yes. by, serving, by, by addressing their needs and, and uh, right, yes. In part, yes, in part to get them out and in part to address their needs while they're in the system so they don't get in more trouble. Okay, okay. So one part of that- So for example, violations of conditions of release. Oh, go ahead. No, well, one part of that would be, and this is, again, we went through this in Justice Reinvestment 1, and the same theme is popping up in Justice Reinvestment 2, in that the judges need more information about what is happening with that defendant. What are their needs? What are their risks and what are their needs? Do they have high, high substance abuse issues? Do they have mental health issues? Um, do they have homelessness as an issue? So that the more information that that judge has in the pre-trial arena, but also when it comes up for uh, sentencing, the prosecution end, the defense end, and the judicial, the judge needs more information beyond what that crime they're being charged with. They need to know what the person's risk is. They need to know what, what areas they're really struggling with in their life that then they can tailor a sentence accordingly. And so we did that. Of, hmm? This is the way of structuring that information so that so that uh, everybody in, in knows what's going on with this individual and, and what the appropriate um, treatment is in, in terms of the justice system or in terms of, uh, in terms of helping them with their needs. Does that, yes. does that, does that sound like, am I getting, am I getting it? <laughs> yes, yes, I would say yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Any other questions? So Karen, do you want to go through the Addison County one? I can if you want me to. I think it's it's so it's the information in there is old enough, so I don't think we necessarily have to go through that in detail. Um, what I'd like the committee members to see is at each intercept, what are some of the initiatives or programs that are in place? that work at that level. Okay, sure. That's what I'm trying to get. It may be all data, but at least so that they can see what can be applied at that particular intercept. Okay, yeah, I can sense? do that. Yes, so, so let's, if we look at intercept point one, which is law enforcement and emergency services. So we're on, for folks who are looking at this on our webpage, we're on the Addison County, the county by county do document. That's Addison County. Sorry, that's, Karen. That's okay. Is everybody there? Yes, they are. Okay, good, good. Um, so if you look at law enforcement and emergency services at intercept point one, um, the team thought it was really important to look at um, what that meant in particular. So we're looking at pre-charge, we're looking at prop population-based approaches before seeing the prosecutor. And in Addison at that point, 
they had counseling services of Addison County, the Community Mental Health Center, which I think is still in existence. Grace House was there, which did public inebriate and detox. Brattleboro Retreat, Porter, Porter Emergency Services Department, Emergency Department, Charter House, John Graham Shelter, Turning Point, and the CSAC Crisis Bed. At so inter- go ahead. Well, at that point, so they've been arrested. And then the question is, does the law enforcement officer press charges? And instead of maybe pressing charges, they could reach out to some of these entities to intercept. Is that correct? Yes. And even if it's not, I mean, they can... A lot of what law enforcement does isn't is responding to quality of life issues as opposed to actual crimes. Um, and we're doing some, some work on studying that to see what they're spending their time doing. So a lot of times they might come across people with mental health issues, or they might come across homeless people. They might come across someone who's calling the police over and over again to, to come and do something for them. And it, it has nothing to do with criminal behavior. And so the police have, for those incidents, the police have the option of, of linking people with other services in their community, which, which they do. And then sometimes it, it's criminal, borderline criminal activity that they can hook someone else, someone up with um, other services in their activity. So it's um, a lot of the pre-charge options are done through the, what we have now are the community justice centers. And I don't think they're on, I don't know how many charts they're on here in 2015, but we have a network of community justice centers that work with the police on direct referrals. So we have other options in the communities now. Mm -hmm. So we have another question, Karen, I think it pertains to CJCs. I have a hunch. Karen? I guess it could. So I work at the Essex Community Justice Center. So nice to meet you, Karen. There you go. Um, and um, the one thing with the Community Justice Center I'll just share is that it's um, different on each county, whether we work with direct referrals or not. So mm-hmm. some counties have that ability and some don't. So that maybe gets to my question of um, pre- appreciate seeing this intercept model I'm in it, but I didn't realize that, you know, my work was part of this intercept model. Um, uh, The intercept zero, I think is a real key one that I see on your brochure. And then I see in the chart, it's not listed there. And I understand it probably pretty extensive, but I feel like that's a key part of it is communities and counties that have probably extensive intercept zero services and programs probably fare better than those that had zero. So I don't know if, if that is part of future, um, you know, spreadsheets or something, or if that's demonstrated anywhere. Yeah, that, um, that it's a really good question. The, I'm not planning on updating the spreadsheet, at least not right now um, with the work I'm doing. But what, one of the things we are doing that I think is actually really, really exciting work is one of our um, our 2020 Bureau of Justice Statistics grants has a project in it that's called Law Enforcement and Mental Health. And it's not so much intercept point zero, it's more intercept point one at this point in time. But at the point we put together the Vermont charts, the Vermont tables on the sequential intercept point services, no one had captured anything about what law enforcement was doing. There's nothing, and there is nothing today there is no list of law enforcement agencies and what they're doing to intervene with people. And some of them have some creative programming. Some of it's based on other models in other states, but there's no list of anything. So in our, in our mental health law enforcement project, we're actually gonna categorize all the strategies and programs that law enforcement have put into place to um, intervene with people who have mental health issues and substance abuse issues and, and what, what the strategies that they're using. We also have some other things going on in that, um, in that project as well, but I think that's one of the things I wanted to capture was something that's never been done here in Vermont. The other thing I'll mention is that um, po- the Policy Research Institute 
just put together Intercept Point Zero. That is kind of hot off the press. If you go to their website, they actually have a whole brochure just around Intercept Point Zero. So as they developed this idea, this conceptual framework, it was always one through five. And everybody, even in the Tri-Branch Task Force and the core team, which ended in 2015, even back then we were talking about, yes, but there are things that can go on before that to prevent even, even um, necessary interventions with law enforcement. And what are those things? And people talked about what are schools doing for, for kids and keeping them out of trouble? We didn't get into that, but we did talk a lot about what happens before intercept point one. And it, it would seem that a lot of people were having that same conversation. So then they put together intercept point zero. So I can share when I get the, when I, we get the law enforcement categorization done, I can certainly share that with you all. So I'm gonna move this along a little bit. Because, you go right ahead. Uh, so, yeah. so if we could get to the second intercept. Sure. Um, I can I can go through this fairly quickly. So okay. inter, intercept point two is post arrest. So we're looking at um, the police arrest them. They haven't been arraigned yet. They may be detained and they haven't seen the judge yet. And so court diversion kicks in here. And that's it for that intercept. Now we have pretrial services, we have Tamarack, we have other options in that intercept. Intercept point three is pretrial serve. Well, I'm sorry, intercept point three is pretrial services. And that's when we were using home detention. Um, the rapid intervention community court um, was being used in Chittenden County and Addison County. And there wasn't a lot going on in that. Um, at that intercept point either. So when we were looking at intercept points two and three, we were seeing a need for more things to be happening there, which is like I said, we put together pre the idea of pretrial services and came out of the work looking at what was missing. Under intercept point four is court disposition. So you see, um, this is where the judiciary is involved, court-based outcomes and corrections-based outcomes. So we have the DOC risk reduction program at this point, home confinement or incarceration, the different sentences that people can get, um, a direct reparative referral, and the crash program comes in here. Um, for reentry, intercept point five, that's reentry from jail, prison, and forensic ho hospitalization is probation, reintegration, and you are all familiar with all this, even though it's changing under our feet as we speak. Reintegration, furlough, conditional reentry, parole, and other programming. And then intercept point six was um, community corrections and community supports, which they've, which is in this model is really um, probation and parole, but this is the point where this kind of, for our chart, this turned into intercept point zero, where you have all the community supports for folks, which is kind of interesting the way they did it. So you'll see all the residential programming that, that goes on at that point. So, so that's, no, go ahead, Karen. I was going to say, so that's uh, that's really all I have on the, the intercept point process. But I did want to say briefly before I get off is that I still use this to frame up our research. Um, and when I write a BJS grant, I have referred to this from 2015 to 2020. I refer to the sequential intercept model. One of the things we have failed to do, and I think David DeMora has talk, talks about this in CSG um, quite frequently, is in Vermont, we need to be looking at our populations. We had a tendency to develop programs without reviewing who's in the criminal justice system and what are their characteristics, what are their risks and needs, and then developing programs to meet those risks and needs. So every time um, I, not every time, almost every time I develop a program, I take a look at who have we not described well yet. And so we have projects, like I said, the law enforcement and mental health project 2020, that's going to look at 
law enforcement and intercept there. We're doing a project that's looking at all the alternative programs. Um, and Representative Dolan, I'm assuming someone's been in touch with your organization at this point. So we're gonna be collecting data from all the alternative programs to look at racial disparities in the system and see if everyone's being served that can be served based on the people coming through at arraignment. We're doing, um, we've done evaluations of the treatment courts. Um, we're looking for the Sentencing Commission and for RDAP, we're looking at racial disparities in sentencing and see what we can find there. Um, and we're looking at, we had a project looking at offender characteristics, but we had a really hard time getting um, Department of Corrections data. So we did um, a partial study of that. And we were also looking to get out of state criminal histories, which are really hard to get. Um, next to impossible, but we haven't given up yet. And then we're looking at, we have a project on probation and parole. So as I develop research studies, we're trying to tie them into what's the research that goes along with each intercept point and what can we learn about the populations of those intercepts and, and what we might need to ensure that people, people are better off in getting their, their needs met. So I hope this is helpful to the committee because <clears throat> we've been working on this for, as Karen said, for a number of years in terms of really making sure that we have certain initiatives or programs or entities kick in at different, different times during this continuum in the justice centers, starting from the time of arrest or maybe a little bit before arrest to charges going through the judicial, the court system, to being sentenced, to being incarcerated, and then to re-enter the community. So that you stop this cycle going through the system. And also you start addressing the real risks and needs of those folks, which then in turn would decrease your corrections population that are incarcerated um, and keep those hard beds that are expensive for folks who uh, need to be there, whether we like it or not. Um, and we've put in a lot of initiatives and that's why when you see the data for Department of Corrections in terms of those folks who are sentenced, you see only a handful of folks with misdemeanors because we have put in these initiatives over the last 15 years. So that's been the policy of the state mm -hmm. and it's being reflected now in terms of who, who's making up our incarcerated population. What are those crimes and convictions? Um, what are they? And then when you start doing the deeper dive, I'm sorry. Um, so it's all reflected within the sequential intercept. And that's the deeper dive in terms of our numbers. If you go back to the numbers that we received from DOC in terms of our 1,288 folks who are incarcerated, over 1,200 of them are there um, convicted for felony charges felony crimes. And as a previous commissioner of corrections said to us way back in the late 90s, why do we need to spend money on a hard bed for folks who are there who are low risk to reoffend, low to moderate risk in severity of crime? Why are we taking up a hard bed for those folks when maybe it'd be more appropriate to um, put in services for them in the community and leave those hard beds for your high risk to reoffend and high severity of crime. So that's where we've been working. And I think that's what the data in terms of the looking at who is incarcerated and the convictions, I think that's the path we've been on for 15, 20 years for that. So questions from folks? Anything for Karen? Okay, Karen, that was easy. That was easy. I just want to offer that if someone's interested in, in doing uh, 
data request on sentences, please feel free to send something in and we can get something back out to you or email me and I can send you an example of something we've already done, um, which would be fine if you're interested in seeing that. I'm sure a few members will be reaching out, Karen. <laughs> that would be fine. And we do have a question, Michelle. Um, I was looking at the documents that we had and I'm not seeing the one that you said was county by county showing what different counties offered. Was that sent, is, is that posted on our website or that was sent through email? By, I'm not. It's sent to us by email. Okay, I'll check with I Phil still. later because I haven't been able to find that and I am curious to look at my county, thanks. Yeah, it's Phil sent it out when we began the testimony with Karen. Okay, just, Scott. Just keep in mind it's old. It's old. Yeah, it's old. <laughs> We've been busy with other things. Um, I, so I don't know whether, huh? thank you. I don't know if this is the right time to bring up sort of the philosophy of, of, of what we're doing here. Um, one, of my, one of my mentors in this area is John Perry, um, who I think all of you know, or the, mm -hmm. he's the chair and, and, and Karen know. Um, and I, I, he's been kind enough to uh, give me some background about how all this what, what's been going on with all this. Um, and one of the concepts he mentioned in one of our conversations that really stuck with me was the idea of reciprocity, the idea of, of uh, uh, doing something, not only doing something for the, uh, the inmates, for, for the offenders, but asking them to do something for, for us, for the community, as a way of reintegrating them in, into the community. Um, and so, I, you know, this might be a long conversation and maybe not, it's not the right time to do it, but I'm just wondering how much that concept is, has also percolated into this, into the sequential intercepts and these other things that we're going to talk about. What I'll say is back when we wrapped this up in 2015, um, there wasn't, there weren't a lot of restorative justice practices in Vermont. There were some. And I think at that point, we were just starting to learn about restorative justice practices. And now, and Representative Dolan probably has more to say about this than I do, but the, the CJCs, the Community Justice Centers, Court Diversion, and have adopted a lot of restorative justice practices, which is very similar to what you're talking about, Representative Campbell. Yeah. And if you see John, please tell him I send my best. Same here. <laughs> he was so wonderful to work with. He um, lived in the committee. He yeah. was in the committee. Oh, he was just he was just so great to have around. He was really good. Um, said the same about both of you, by the way. <laughs> And, um, and so there's more of that going on now. And I think people are having community meetings that are using circle processes um, to have more respectful conversations. I think the CJCs are utilizing um, restorative justice practices and, and court diversion as well. So I think there is some of that going on. Beginning to, to infiltrate the, the, um, the, institution, the institutional models that we've set up you would say, okay, that's 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 good to know because it really sounds like a much more holistic approach to to uh, helping people become, you know, sort of rejoin society and become become useful members of the community. I think more can be done, but I think I think we've got a good start. Great, great, good to know. Thank you. The big thing that John Perry and and uh, John Gorchuk, Commissioner of DOC at the time, because they were like this, the two of them, was. Um, really putting initiatives in place to repair the harm for the, yeah. the defendant, the offender would repair the harm. That, that's the goal mm -hmm. for that and make the community whole for that's that. Great. Other questions? Anyone? Don't all speak up. Okay, thank you, Karen. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was very nice to meet you all. Very nice to be back in front of the committee. And uh, I'm sure you'll be back at some point. Thank you. Do folks want to take any time you need me? Oh, I'm sure you're going to get you're going to get some questions from some of the members. I'm sure that would be fine. That would be fine. I look forward to it. Great. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Bye bye. Do members want to take a quick five minute break?
Let's do that. Let's take a really fast five minute break and we're coming back with a DOC to talk about the, a report that's on our webpage under our reports section that deals with, um, it says graduated sanctions and reentry housing. We wanna look at the reentry housing piece with Dale Crook. So remember to block your video and...